Uh, just a quick update. We are going to have the next month meetup the same second Thursday, Thursday of the month in Solaris. So I hope to see you there as well. And we're going to go to the next page. Yes. Uh, a big shout for our host, Quicksit. Give us a round of applause, please. <laughs> for giving us good pizzas and beers and also goodies for the speakers. That's good to be a speaker. Uh, I just want to give some time to uh, David from Fixit to have some talk with you. <laughs> of course, I need an office. You mark Fixit. So welcome again. I'm going to be extremely fast. I guess that's more or less the point, just to introduce a little bit what we do. Probably quicks it doesn't sound very really familiar to most of you. So I guess it's a very good time to actually, first of all, connect the Beamer and then tell you a couple of words about it and why we're actually hosting an Elixir meetup. So first of all, quicks it. So we want to start with the why, right? So then we'll talk about what we do and so on. But this is more or less what we call our mission. So why we're here coming in every Monday morning, trying to make the world a slightly better place. So we really want to connect people, doing this by connecting physically people to one another, but also to let them explore the world and get used to you know this uh, big blue thingy, which is around us. Um, this is kind of a, a huge thing if you think a little bit about the the industry about the travel and how to move around because at the moment uh, we're still kind of in a very pre-revolutionary phase when you have still many many different part of the travel journey in different spots so um, you have airline on one side you have trains on a different side your buses and so on and on but there is no really a unique solution that you can use even google is honestly kind of bad at giving you results about it so we realize that there is this huge gap, so it's difficult to get from one place to another. Just simplify quite a lot. And this is more or less where we actually want to solve this. So you have to go to different places, put there all the combination information you get, study quite a lot, and only at the end of it, you can actually probably <laughs> be able to travel. With Quixit, we want to unify this in one single solution, and this is actually what we're working on. So having one single application, one single website where you can start from any place and to get to any destination worldwide. Of course, it sounds kind of a, a huge thing to do, but you know, we have to start somewhere. So for the moment, we are really focusing on, on Germany. Uh, this is where we actually have the full ground coverage, so we can get to any small location thanks to the Deutsche Bahn, Flixbus, and all the other smaller operators on the ground, plus to any destination worldwide thanks to flights. Uh, but this is again not enough so for us the next step is actually covering the entire europe with ground transportation plus traveling to really every single corner of the earth but doing this is not enough for us so we really want to also improve the way you actually travel around so it's not enough to switch in places if it's still kind of a uh, slow thing and complex where you really need information so we really also want to make it fast and in order to make it fast it means one single payment one single booking and you have all the tickets with you. So in order to really simplify quite a lot, we you know, um, realize that it's just four small steps that can make the experience much, much better. So from one side, it's about the search, how to really connect to any destination, even from small city to other small cities. You can have like a very good overview of all the alternatives that you have. So whether it's flying plus train, or maybe like taking a very long bus or whatever it is, it, they're all available on Quixit. You can definitely combine different things, which is you know the key of the uh, entire solution we're working on. So train and buses and airplane all in one single solution. And at the end, you can book everything with us. So if you're kind of familiar with some of these names, this is actually how do we find out our place into this market. So it's a very strange chart if you look at it. So from one side, you have the local on the left, meaning really how do I get from here to Kreuzberg? And on the other side, you have global, so really worldwide uh, connections. And on the vertical axis, you have the unimodality, so only trains or only buses or only flights, and the intermodality, which is actually what Quixit is uh, covering. So we are into the north uh, east, so 
very global reach, getting destination worldwide everywhere, and being able to connect very different things all into one thing journey. Um, and how do we do this is actually a very interesting topic and it's actually why we use Elixir quite heavily. So first of all, think about very quickly, how can you connect different things that are not connected? So we created this routing engine that allow us to really navigate between different modes of transportation. So imagine all the schedules and all the uh, different uh, geo coordinate location from station all around the world or connecting to a single place, using this to find the best path, which is not always the, the shortest, sometimes it's very complicated to really find the best one. <laughs> On top of that, actually being able to realize which is the most convenient. So again, once finding the, the right journeys is not enough, you want to find something which is cheaper and faster. And at the end of the day, also being able to act on that. So finding a journey is not enough, you're unable to book it and actually travel with that. So this is the final part of our journey. Our stack is pretty cool, honestly. So we are a very young company, so we don't have to deal with <laughs> legacy code or anything. And we started with kind of the best of the class. Uh, we use Elixir and Falcon on our uh, on the backend, mainly on this itinerary builder, React and Redux, plus Android and Kotlin and uh, iOS for the, for the front end. So very native since the beginning. And that's more or less it. So we are, of course, hiring. So if you're interested, just have a look at the, uh, our career page. And at least, please just try to get the, the, web, the apps or visit the website. I think you might like it. Five stars is always very a good thing to do. The same. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, David. For today. We have uh, three tags by Jorgi, Frigo, and uh, Leonardo. Uh, the first one is about blockchain. Even though the Bitcoin price went down, it's coming up again, so pay attention. You can keep the, your wallet in Elixir, that's nice. And uh, we are going to talk about the app scene uh, and the GraphQL. I saw a tweet from someone that the child of the affair between WSTL and SOAP and REST would be GraphQL. So let's see if it's true. And, we're, and also we are going to talk about the REST uh, running test in the cluster of nodes. That's also an interesting thing. Give the speakers random applause and then we can start. Uh, so, today I'm going to speak about the blockchain wallet. Uh, first of all, I would like to know how many of you are familiar with blockchain? 
more or less. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll say a few words about uh, blockchain, how it works uh, in, in the most simple way, just uh, to uh, get everyone in track. Uh, and then I'll continue with the wallet. So first of all, a few words about me. My name is Yuri Spasov. I am an Android M, uh, recently an Elixir developer. I'm interested in IoT solutions and blockchain technology as uh, we started to work on it recently. So uh, these are going to be um, the stuff that um, we're going to talk about today. So first of all, Control, uh, this is the company that I come from. Uh, I'm going to say a few words about who we are and what we do. And then I'm going to go straight into the core functionalities and the structure of a blockchain wallet. What is mnemonic code words and how we do them. Uh, hierarchical key pairs and um, encrypting our wallet. <laughs> so, uh, well, we are um, outsourcing based uh, company. Uh, we do mainly IoT solutions developed in Erlang uh, or Elixir. Uh, we're basing our technology in Erlang since 2009, but we switched to Elixir and adapted our software uh, since uh, 2015. Uh, we're uh, actually, because we do a lot of IoT uh, development, we are actually having a hardware team that is developing our hardware components. Um, so working with terminal computers, uh, Raspberry Pis, and all this stuff. Uh, I cannot go too, too deep into it because I'm not on the hardware uh, side of things. Uh, but I'm sure that, uh, I'm sure that we, we can say that we can do a lot of hardware stuff uh, and components. Uh, blockchain technology, um, this is uh, something new to us. Uh, we started working on this uh, a few months ago um, and we're actually working uh, with Atelity. Uh, this is a company that is creating a new blockchain and uh, they have uh, two main uh, developments. First one is in Erlang. So they're actually uh, developing their uh, core blockchain implementation in Erlang and we're making a second one in, in Elixir uh, because um, they think that in the future Elixir is going to be um, the future. So that's why we would need to have an implementation in Elixir as well. Uh, and in this part, we're actually developing our um, blockchain um, uh, core, the whole blockchain developed on uh, Elixir and a wallet uh, next to it. Um, we're actually ha having uh, an Elixir Academy that we are doing in uh, um, our main city, Varna, Bulgaria, um, where we actually teach uh, new people in Elixir and um, that's how we actually basically find new people to join our company because not not a lot of people know elixir so we have to teach them ourselves so okay uh before i jump into the core functionality i would just uh, want to say a few words about blockchain so what is blockchain um in the core structure a blockchain as the name suggests is a chain of blocks each block has a set of transactions and each transaction is, you can say, like a company, uh, like a bank account transaction. Someone sends money to another one, so it actually has the account of the person that's sending money, the account of the person that is receiving the money, and the amount of money that is sent. All these transactions are built into one block. This block is uh, created and mined by the miners, and then. Um, what is actually uh, the mining stuff? The mining stuff is uh, because the blockchain is, uh, you could say that it's structure way of uh, um, stacking the blocks on top of each other. Each block is referenced to the previous block. Uh, and this way you cannot um, go inside the chain and switch one of the blocks with another because it uh, then will not be linked as, as it is. Um, uh, in the in, in the chain um, so what a miner does is takes uh, he takes a bunch of transactions the most um, beneficial for him because each transaction has a fee uh, which fee is going to be uh, taken by the miner so he takes a bunch of transactions and what he actually does is uh, making this um, simple uh, you could say mathematical equation 
which is actually to find a hash which has a number of zeros in front of it. Um, and he just starts incrementing, incrementing until he finds a solution which has this exact hash that he's searching for. And when he does find a solution, he broadcasts this uh, block to all of other all, all of the other miners. And while they are mining, they see, oh, somebody found it. Okay, I'll take it and build from there on because uh, they have no purpose to try to find something that is already found. Um, and the base, the most base idea is that um, the whole blockchain is um, decentralized system, which means that uh, the data is not stored in uh, one location, uh, in one database uh, system. It's actually in all of the miners. Each miner has uh, the whole blockchain so that he can uh, evaluate that each transaction is a valid one so that uh, the person that is actually sending money has the money that he's trying to send. And to check this, he has to go through all the history of the blockchain and see that he actually has this money. And that's why if some, uh, some one of the miner uh, the next day decides to, okay, uh, I don't want to mine anymore, and he shuts down his system, uh, there's a lot of other people that oh, have this, um, the whole blockchain on their system as well. So uh, this means that there's uh, no one place where the data is stored, it's stored all around the world and in each of the miners' computers. Um, you could say that uh, today in, in a Bitcoin, the chain is so long that it takes a, f a few hundred gigabytes to have it, the whole thing, uh, and which means it's uh, a lot of a long blockchain and the hardness is going up each uh, 2048 blocks. And that's why it's even harder each and every day to mine a new block. Uh, but I don't know, uh, people still find it, uh, find that it's um, money worth and uh, they go into it. Um, so what is a wallet? So a wallet is actually um, the software that is going to uh, give us the possibility to have public and private keys, um, which actually is okay. Well, the public key, we can uh, think of it as the, our bank account number. Uh, we can uh, give our bank account number to everyone and what they can actually do is send us money. They cannot do anything else than send us money. Uh, so it's harmless to send our bank account. Uh, and a private key, we can think of it as the password to our banking account system. Um, we should not give it to anyone because if he has our password, he can take our money and send it to his account and we're done. Um, a wallet actually uh, creates our private and public keys um, and is managing them and in, in some way um, in a fully built wallet it would actually also uh, create um, uh, make a transaction so if some if you want to send uh, money to someone you say okay I want to send uh, this amount of uh, money with this fee to this address and it will actually make a transaction and give it to one of the peers uh, and they will actually maybe add it to their pool and mine it. And then we can see, okay, the a transaction is added to a block. This block is mined. It's already on, on the chain. So we could say we're halfway done uh, because usually now we'd have to wait a few blocks so that we're completely sure that the transaction, the transaction is uh, is set there and it's not moving. Um, in this implementation, um, we've actually uh, created a mnemonic code words, which I'm going to uh, speak about in a moment. Uh, deriving pri private and public keys, um, managing our keys, and working with hierarchical uh, key pairs. Um, uh, by the way, um, when I go into uh, explaining, uh, because I'm going to go through the code and explain how we actually done everything, if um, someone has um, something to say or if he wants to stop me, he can stop me at any time and we can discuss something a bit more. Uh, so first one is uh, creating a proper seed. And for us, this is actually creating a mnemonic phrase. What is a mnemonic phrase? 
so before I go into the mnemonic phrase, I should uh, say what is actually a seed. A seed uh, is random value. We can see it like, like this here. This could be our seed. Um, this random value is then used with a hash function to create our private key. And from our private key, we can derive our public key and so on. Uh, the thing is that uh, this um, seed, if we have to remember it so that we can derive our wallet anywhere, anytime, any place with each uh, software, uh, it would be hard to remember it by heart. We would have to write it somewhere. And when we write something somewhere, we know that we can lose it or someone can take it. So best thing is to remember it by heart. But it's quite hard. That's where um, mnemonic gold words come into place. Uh, so that they replace this thing with some words that we can remember and make it easier for us uh, to remember our C by heart and then not write it anywhere. Uh, so here we can see a diagram which is actually uh, showing how we go through uh, a random number to the mnemonic code words. Um, once we have our mnemonic code words, from then, uh, from there on, to create a private key, we would actually need to use a specific function, which I'm not going to go much about uh, because there are a lot of libraries that do it, um, but it actually just takes the words and creates uh, the seed that they represent. Um, one thing I should mention is uh, that when we uh, use this uh, mnemonic phrase, it will create the same seed every single time. Um, so all of these uh, segments that we see here, um, I, I'll explain how, we, how we've done them uh, through code. Uh, but uh, to go here uh, shortly, we're generating a random number, so an entropy, which uh, in our case is going to be 100, 128 bits, which in the end is going to represent into having a 12-word mnemonic phrase. Uh, because we can have a 12-word mnemonic phrase, we can have 24-word mnemonic phrase, but 24, let's say it's a, it's a big number. We have to remember quite a lot of words. So 12 is, is okay. Um, so we first generate our entropy. Uh, then through a hash function, we generate a checksum. We combine them. Then we split them into 12 segments of 11 bits each. And each segment is going to represent an index or a row uh, of a word list. What is a word list? A word list is... Um, text document file that we have predefined uh, that has uh, for, uh, two, 2048 words. Um, these words are not something that we create ourselves. We can, we can download a lot of um, word lists for, for a lot of languages. So they're already predefined. Um, we can create one, but it, it wouldn't make much sense because they are created in a way that uh, the words that they are in there are not so similar to each other so that you can um, mistake one word for another and make it harder for the user. Um, so these uh, 11 bits of 12, um, 12 segments of 11 bits is going to be then, um, each segment is going to be then converted to an uh, integer number, which is going to be the row of the word in the word list. And we go through all of the 12 segments <laughs> and then we pick the words that we have um, in, in these rows. Um, so how we do this? Um, this function here is going to make all the work. Uh, so all of the segments that we have there is going to be uh, done in, the, in here. Um, so we generate our entropy, our checksum, and then uh, we just pipe them uh, together, the functions, to get to the final result. So how we create an entropy, we're just using the crypto library from Erlang <laughs> that is going to create a random byte uh, from our entropy byte size. Uh, for us, it's going to be uh, 128 bits now uh, because we want to end up with 12 um, mnemonic uh, words. Uh, then we generate our checksum, um, which is uh, just hashing the entropy um, turning it into a binary list and then slicing the first four elements. Uh, four elements in this case uh, because um, 
we take the size of the entropy divided by 32. And this is actually how many uh, pieces we have to take from the entropy. Um, in, in our case, it's going to be 128 divided by 32, which is going to end up in four. So we take the first four elements and then we're going to concatenate them uh, to the checksum, uh, to the entropy. So we end up with a size that is going to be then divided to 12 segments of 11 bits each. Um, here is the function that we uh, that is going to uh, create the list of uh, zeros and ones from our binary, so from our entropy and from our checksum. Uh, it's just pattern matching the, the binary, taking uh, each uh, byte, uh, each bit, and <coughs> adding it to accumulator, and then reversing the order uh, to make it in the correct order. Um, Next, what we do is once we have all uh, the uh, zeros and ones concatenated to a string, we uh, want to uh, split them into 12 segments of 11 bits. So that's what we do here. Uh, similar to, to the previous, we just uh, pattern match the first 11 uh, bits and add them to the accumulator and then reverse the order. Um, here we're just going to uh, convert them uh, from uh, this uh, zero and one representation to an integer number, which is uh, in the end going to be our rows from our word list. In here we can see um, how uh, we uh, we are getting the rows from the word list. So we have a function that is going to read our text file and. It's going to take all of the words, convert them into tuples, and then go through uh, through the list of words and pick the ones that we have from the rows. And in here as rows, we would actually call the function for generating our rows or our indexes. And in the end, we're going to end up with, um, with a string of all of the, uh, the 12 mnemonic words that the user has to remember or write somewhere. So once we have our mnemonic phrase, we know that the next step is creating our private key. Uh, so driving key pairs. Um, so we, in our implementation, we follow the Bitcoin uh, derivation method uh, because uh, a lot of the blockchain versions have their own methods. Um, Bitcoin being one of the, we could say, more, more simple one to implement uh, and maybe straightforward. Um, uh, so this is actually what I'm going to show. Uh, to deriv derivation, um, I've just made a couple of changes here and there so that in the end, if we choose to derive identity keys, we end up with keys that are uh, derived in following the uh, the derivation method of Bitcoin, but ending up with keys that are different uh, in a way that they're um, specific for eternity. And of course, I'm mainly using the Erlang crypto model and uh, we're going to see the function used from it. So uh, first I want to show the structure of our keys. This is actually going to be a structure of extended keys uh, because Our public and private keys are just uh, a binary, uh, but extended keys, uh, to which I'm going to go uh, in a bit and explain what they are. Uh, here we have the structure. Um, so in here, when we create a key, uh, we firstly say uh, if it's going to be on the mainnet or testnet and choose whether it's going to be a Bitcoin or a Trinity key. So the structure that we have here, so we have to state what is our currency, Bitcoin or Eternity. In this case, the network, testnet on mainnet, the version. Um, what is the version? The version is, you could, you could uh, say it as well as a prefix. Uh, when we end up with uh, the extended keys, uh, the extended key uh, in the Bitcoin version, we have uh, for a public key, we have XPUB, the first four words, 
and for private key XPRV, um, which is going to say to us that this is Bitcoin key. So when we uh, look at an extended uh, key, which is actually a long string of uh, formatted in base 58, looking at the first four symbols, we can say if this is a private key or public key and on which network it is. Uh, if you uh, look at the extended key of Dogecoin, is actually uh, quite sim similar. They just um, uh, change a few of the stuff. So let's say it's not XPRV, it's DPRV for Dogecoin uh, and so on. So uh, what I've done for the Eternity keys is just uh, change the version so that when we um, uh, are actually uh, making our extended key, is going to end up with, um, with let's say, IPV for a private key and IPU for a public key. Uh, the depth, uh, the depth is how um, how deep we are in the derivation method. So uh, here we talk about uh, hierarchical key pairs. So if if we think of it as a tree structure and we have the master private key on the bottom. Um, when we want to derive a uh, next branch of keys, we just go one depth inside. And on this branch, if we want to create another branch, we increment the depth. And each time we go in, in a branch of a branch of a branch, we increase the depth of the derivation. Um, the fingerprint is, um, is just a binary that is um, made from our public key, concatenated concatenated to our structure uh, that is going to be needed to um, finalize our extended keys. Of course, we have our child, num child number. Child number is the leaf of the branch. Uh, so in each branch, we can have a, num a set of numbers of keys and the number of key it is, we have to um, state it in the, in the child number. Chain code is um, one of the additional um, binaries that is uh, created when you create a key. Uh, it, it is actually somewhat of a, of a protection for, for the keys themselves and the, the key itself being a public or a private key. So going into deriving our master key and master chain code. So the first thing that we actually derive from our seed. Uh, so what we do here is take our seed, uh, which is going to be, of course, in binary. Uh, we uh, take the network and what type of a wallet we're, uh, we're creating, <laughs> a identity wallet or a Bitcoin one. Um, so we just uh, take the type. If we have identity key, we are calling the crypto function with um, the key being uh, identity key. This key is just actually a string. Uh, in the Bitcoin, uh, it uh, says Bitcoin seed. So in identity, we call it identity seed. Uh, so the crypto ECMAC uh, function is just taking a um, hash a value, a key, and the data. The data being our seed. Um, so what we're going to end up is uh, a long binary that we're then going to uh, pass to uh, the next function, build master key, which is uh, going to pattern match this binary, which has the first 32 uh, bytes as the private key and the next 32 bytes as the master chain code. Uh, this is actually the first thing we derive from our seed, our private master key that is going to be used to derive all other keys that we have in our uh, wallet tree structure. Um, so we actually create a private key um, structure and we add the brief key and the chain code. At this point, uh, we have depth at zero, child number at zero, fingerprint at zero, because this is our base level. This is our base key. Uh, if someone has this key, he has everything no matter how deep we have derived something, because with this key, we can derive every single key uh, possible to derive. 
so generating a public key, uh, we just have a function that is uh, going to uh, change our, uh, derive our public key from our private key. Um, so we have a few function here, few functions here, uh, because uh, depending on whether uh, in, in the different places that I, we, we call them, um, we have uh, generating a public key, which is a normal one and a compressed one. Um, what is a compressed public key? Uh, a public key uh, in, in the Bitcoin, Bitcoin world is, um, is a point on, on a diagram of the, um, on the elliptic curve diagram. So we have a point on the elliptic curve diagram, which is going to have a X coordinate and a Y coordinate. These both coordinates uh, concatenated uh, as well as a prefix is going to end up with our public key. A compression is just um, uh, taking the, the this, uh, this, this key with the X coordinate and the Y coordinate and just use the Y coordinate as our public key. Um, and actually, if, if we want, if we have a compressed public key through uh, the elliptic curve functionality uh, or mathematics, we can uh, take this Y and generate the X as well and, and make the, uh, the whole key again. Uh, so generating a public key, again, we have a crypto function for this uh, and we're using the elliptic curve as uh, CESP256K1, we have a lot of different elliptic curve um, values, but this is the one that uh, Bitcoin uses. Uh, so that's what we're using here. Um, we're actually creating, of course, a public key uh, structure. Uh, we're just taking uh, the data from the private key and we just change uh, the, the, the key itself uh, because all of the other data is the same. Um, Depth, fingerprint, child number, and chain code. Uh, so managing our keys. Uh, first and most important thing is never store our keys uh, somewhere in um, in the software uh, because someone can can hack it or whatever, and he can take them. Uh, so what we actually do is derive the key when we need it. No matter how deep the derivation is, it works quite fast uh, most of the times. So we don't have problem to derive them whenever we need them. Um, we have few uh, options here for storing our wallet. First, we have storing the encrypted mnemonic code words. So um, one thing we can do is each time um, a person wants to uh, send uh, something, we, we say, okay, give us uh, your mnemonic code words. We're going to derive your private key and then uh, say which key you want to use so that you can you send, you say, send the money. Uh, uh, but this is not a lot of user friendly. He has to type this every time. So what we actually do is encrypt the mnemonic code words with a password and store uh, this encrypted uh, data on, on the PC. So, so that when he wants to derive a key, he just writes the password. We decrypt his mnemonic code words and use them uh, to derive the key that he needs. Um, and the second ask for the user every time, I would not prefer this, uh, but it's the most safest way. Uh, maybe. There's a way that they can take our um, mnemonic words either way. Uh, so, creating a wallet. Mm, this is going to be the functionality we have for actually creating the wallet. Um, so, a person, uh, we will take uh, a password, which is going to be the password that we encrypt uh, the mnemonic code words with. We have a path, so when the PC he wants to store the, um, the wallet itself, passphrase. Uh, <clears throat> Passphrase is um, something in common with the mnemonic code words. Um, you could, um, in some places, you can see it as salt. Uh, it's additional um, uh, 
an additional pass phrase for the mnemonic code words. Meaning, if we create, when we are creating a mnemonic code words, we can state, oh, I want to create my mnemonic code words with a pass phrase. So when we are uh, creating uh, the wallet, we can say, my, I want my passphrase to be, I don't know, some password. And when we are uh, deriving later uh, the keys, we have to use the mnemonic phrase and this passphrase to create the correct keys. If we, uh, if someone has a, our, if we have a passphrase and I give some, some of you my mnemonic code words, he cannot create my uh, keys because he, do, he doesn't have a passphrase. You can think the passphrase as a uh, 13th word of the mnemonic code words. It's the simplest way to, uh, to explain it. Um, but uh, there's uh, a question which would be, okay, why would they need this? Because then uh, if I store my uh, mnemonic code words, I have to store this as well. Uh, in a way, it doesn't make much sense to have one uh, because uh, in the first way, you have to keep safe your mnemonic code words, and now you have to keep safe your mnemonic code words in your uh, passphrase. Uh, so that's why, uh, in, by default, we don't have a passphrase. Uh, and as options, uh, we state whether we want to create an identity or a Bitcoin key. Uh, so first, of course, we derive our mnemonic passphrase, and then... Uh, we're going to um, uh, encrypt the mnemonic passphrase, uh, save it to the path that uh, the user said, uh, and then uh, show to the user what is his mnemonic phrase, what is his, uh, what is the path that uh, he saved the wallet, and what type of wallet he actually created. Uh, so first, we have to build uh, the wallet. So building the wallet, meaning building the, the file. Uh, so in here, we're just going to, uh, in the file, we're going to save uh, the mnemonic, uh, the passphrase. I'm actually saving the passphrase as well, uh, because then you would have to remember the, the password for decrypting the wallet and the passphrase of the wallet. Um, uh, so in our case, I'm going to um, uh, put the passphrase as well in the file. Um, and then I'm just going to save it in the directory that he said and write inside it. Nothing much uh, here. Voting the wallet, uh, quite simple. We um, will load the data, we decrypt, uh, decrypt it, and then go through it and take uh, the mnemonic, which will be our first 11, uh, first 12 uh, elements, then uh, the 12. Uh, the 13th is going to be our wallet type, and the last is going to be our passphrase. Um, so yeah, and if the wallet doesn't doesn't open for some reason, we're going to um, throw some error message to use it. So uh, this world wallet um, is going to be used each time we want to get a key being a private or a public one. So for private, for the private key, we state where the, the file is and we state the password for decrypting the file. Um, then we're going to load, uh, load the file uh, and uh, then take the, the mnemonic, wallet type and passphrase, generate our seed with our mnemonic using the passphrase. If he doesn't have a passphrase, here we're just uh, giving an empty string and then we generate our master key using the wallet type that is uh, stored as well in the wallet. And then we return the private key for the user. Uh, the public key is just going to first call uh, the private key function so that we have the private key and then use the private key to create our public key and then return it using the function in uh, the keeper module. Extended keys. Uh, so the extended keys, uh, well, one thing I, I forgot to mention in the mnemonic code words is that the mnemonic code words and the extended keys are actually Bitcoin improvement proposals. What is a Bitcoin improvement proposal? A Bitcoin improvement proposal is a proposal from uh, the community 
or people that are ex, um, into um, the blockchain and they find uh, new ways uh, to uh, improve the, the blockchain development or the key development or some aspect of, of it. Uh, they make a proposal, they post it uh, in the um, GitHub page of, uh, of Bitcoin. And some of these proposals are now um, like standard. And for uh, usually for a wallet, a standard is having uh, the mnemonic phrase, which is uh, VIP uh, 39 and extended keys, uh, which is BIP 32. Uh, if you go to uh, the GitHub page and uh, go through uh, the BIPs, you see um, a long readme file explaining how you can implement this into your wallet. And uh, in the bottom, you can see actually uh, some implementation in different languages. Uh, the extended keys, um, you could say it's um, a bit um, misleading at points uh, in the documentation, uh, but actually when, when you do it, it's a bit straightforward. Uh, so we're just going to see how we're using, uh, how we, um, we use the hierarchical key keepers, how we derive them and um, the specific structure I already mentioned in the structure of the public and private <coughs> keys and the derivation method, we're going to see it in just a moment. Um, so one of, the, one of the first things we have into deriving um, extended keys is to <coughs> see um, which key we have to derive. So uh, the main thing here is the path. The path is going to represent to us um, which key we want to derive. And here I have um, printed two different paths that the user could type. Um, first one is uh, a small m slash 10 slash two um, single quotation mark slash 44. So what, what this mean? Each slash is going to be a branch. So each slash is going to be uh, incrementation of our depth. The number we hit, see here is our child number. So if we have m slash 10, we're just deriving the next branch of our master key, the 10th key of this branch. Next, we go to the, the, the branch of the 10th key. We use the second one. Um, what this simple quotation mark means. So, um, in the deriving of the extended keys, we have two types of derivation method. We have normal and we have hardened derivation. Hardened derivation means that we're deriving uh, a key which uh, child number is above a specific uh, number which is close to one of the merge send numbers uh, to million something thousand something hundred it's a specific number from which on we're deriving um hundred keys and before that we have normal keys but uh, instead of writing two million four hundred and twenty one thousand or whatever we just say the second one of the hundred keys with a single quotation mark uh which would mean that we have to concat uh to add this to, to the specific number, so we know that we are doing the second uh, key of the hardnet keys. Uh, uh, in the code, I I'll explain it a bit easier. Uh, so we have uh, two functions, um, uh, two call function here. Um, we take the key, we take the path, we're just going to pattern match the, the path. Oh, uh, one thing is that if we have a small M, in this case, we're going to drive a private key. If we have a big M, we're going to drive a public key. Um, that's why we pattern match the path. We take the first um, string with a slash, and from now on, we know, okay, this is a private key, or okay, this is a public key. Uh, then we go to the next one, which is going to go through the path and uh, find which uh, keys we are actually deriving which uh, child number numbers um, 
So we go through the path, we pattern match, and in here, if we find um, a single quotation mark, we're just going to take the number at the Emerson prime number. Uh, one of the Emerson prime number, I think is the 12th uh, or somewhere around there, plus one. And this is going to be the, the number of the child number we're deriving. And then uh, we, um, this path list um, uh, is, um, this function is going to retur return a list of the child numbers we are deriving. So in here, uh, with, uh, we were just calling this function, which is taking the, the key, which in, in, um, in our case would be the master private key, um, the, taking the path list and the network. Uh, so we go through the path list, we take the first index that we have in there, and uh, using the key we have passed to this function, we derive the, the, the child of this key, uh, and then we call the function again uh, with the child key itself. And then the next time we are in here, we're actually uh, in the first, uh, where um, the key would be the first a child key. So in following our example, uh, first we're going to um, create the 10th uh, key of the master key. And then when we derive it, we're going to pass it again to this function so that from it, it um, its key, we create the next one of uh, the next index. Um, so what is the derivation method itself? Um, we have uh, derivation methods for uh, for the private key. Uh, so here we're just uh, seeing whether we are doing uh, normal derivation or hard derivation. Uh, the changes in, in the in the and the derivation method is um, subtle, <coughs> but it's there. So in the normal derivation, we're just going to uh, create a compressed public key. This is why we use the the compressed keyword. Um, then we call this uh, specific crypto uh, function again. Uh, uh, this is actually the function that we used when we were creating our uh, private key. But this time for a key, we use the chain code. And from for data, we use uh, the compressed public key with the index of the key we are deriving, the index uh, being the child number. Um, then, of course, we're going to end up with uh, direct key and chain code. Uh, then what we're going to do is uh, take this key, convert it into an integer, and uh, add it to uh, this derived key. We add it to the parent key. <coughs> then uh, we take the remainder of it, dividing it by this um, number n. This number n is, uh, they call it the order of the curve of the elliptic curve, uh, which is a quite long number um, that it's, uh, it's uh, stated in the elliptic curve uh, method. Um, so then uh, we convert it to a binary and now we have our uh, child key. Um, in the hardened derivation method, the, the difference is that for uh, in, in the data, we're not using uh, the compressed public key, but we're using uh, the key um, concatenated with um, one more value. Why we do this? Uh, we do this because the compressed public key has um, one byte more data than the private key. So the private key is 32 bits, the compressed public key is 33 bits, and that's why we add um, one byte in front of it, a zero. <coughs> and from then on, it's it's the same thing. Um, we're adding the direct key to, uh, uh, <clears throat> to the um, uh, parent key, um, divide it, take the remainder, uh, convert it to binary and 
push it again to the, the right key function. Um, so if we are coming here with a public key, uh, actually with the public key, we don't have a hard derivation. Um, if you go and read about it, you would uh, say that if we derive a hardened key, it would be not good because it uh, the key has elements that could be used uh, to um, to maybe uh, find our chain code and from, from our chain code find our some of the derived private keys and then go through the master key. That's why we don't use this. Um, so for a public key, we just have a normal derivation. The process is somewhat similar. Uh, we create a serialized public key. Uh, and then of course, again, we call the, the same uh, HMAC uh, function. We pass the chain code again as a key and as data, uh, serialized public key with an index, which is actually quite similar uh, to the derivation method of the public key in the normal derivation. The difference here is in the end, we're doing elliptic curve point addition function functionality, which um, you would have to use the Bitcoin's implementation for this because it's quite hard to make it your, yourself. Uh, I've tried, I've struggled, and in the end, I, I found a Erlang uh, library that has an if calling the uh, C functionality, and that's what I'm using actually here to make it work. Uh, uh, so, because in here, what we do is um, being on the elliptical diagram, we add the points in some specific mathematical way, um, which is quite difficult to, to, uh, to make. And that's why uh, I found this and, and we use it. Uh, so I'm not going to go much into what is what this function does. What it uh, actually ends up with is giving our child key. Uh, and again, we pass it to the right key function because in the end we have, uh, we take all of the data uh, we have for the key and push it uh, to the map structure of, of the key itself, no matter being the public or the private key. So we change the key being the child key now, the chain code, the new chain code that we, we have derived, uh, depth. Um, we just add one depth to it each time because each time we call this function, we know that we are going uh, one branch deeper into the derivation. We are creating our fingerprint, which I'm going to go into a minute. And uh, we state our child, child number, which is the index that we use in the derivation process. So the fingerprint, um, we have a few functions here, depending whether uh, we're deriving the uh, fingerprint from a private key or public key. Um, if we're going from a private key, we have to derive a compressed public key and then go to the fingerprint. If we have a public key, we just compress it and go to the fingerprint function um, in a derivation. What we actually do here is double hash the public key um first with chat 56 and then with write nd 160 and then from uh, the binary uh, result that we get we just take the first four bytes and this is actually our fingerprint so what is uh the exact structure of an extended key uh this is quite important because if we don't have this in the correct order we're not going to derive the key how we want it to be. Uh, so first we have four bytes, uh, which is our version that I, 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 uh, I explained, which is um, different for mainnet and testnet, whether we do a public key or private key. The next one byte is our depth. Uh, the next four bytes is the fingerprint. The next four bytes is the child number. And then we have 32 bytes for chain code and 33 bytes for serialized key for the serialized version of a public and private key. We've seen what is the serialized version of a public key. 
Um, what is the serialized version of a private key? The serialized version of a private key is taking a private key and concatenating a zero in front of it uh, because the serialized version of the pub public key is 33 bits and the private key is 32. We have to make it 33. We just concatenate a zero in front of it, make it 33. That's the serialization of the private key. Um, here we can actually see it. So if we come from a private key, we just concatenate a zero and continue with the serialized function. Uh, if we're coming from a public key, we compress it and then pass uh, the compressed version of the key. Uh, so here we can see that we're um, um, taking the, the values and add them in the correct order that we have to um, add them so that we end up with the correct um, version in the end. Um, here, what we do is format our keys. So from the whole binary that we have, uh, we just um, encode it into base 58. This is the en um, encoding that uh, Bitcoin uses that is uh, specific uh, because it, um, uh, for an example, it doesn't use a big I because you can miss, uh, think it for an L or something like this. So we, uh, some of the letters are stripped out because they would make confusions, confusions. And then we do our extended key. As you can see, it's quite a long uh, key. And in here, you can see what, what is actually uh, the, um, the prefix. In our key, in our example for identity, we have I, U, B for public key and I, P, V for private key. Uh, one thing that you cannot see here, but you have to do is make a checksum and add it to the structure as well. I haven't uh, added it here uh, because uh, the module that I'm, I'm, I'm using here, the library for base encoding, um, it has some functionality to add the checksum as well. That's why we call encode 58 check because we're going to uh, derive the checksum, add it to uh, the data and then derive. Uh, but uh, the checksum, what it actually is, is just uh, taking the whole structure um, and then, as far as I remember, I think we hashed it and then take the first four uh, bytes as well. So a lot similar to the way we do the, the fingerprint. So it's not actually um, uh, hard to do. I just uh, didn't have to use it because I had it in here. That's why uh, I didn't include it. Uh, but it's quite simple to do. And it, of course, it's said it in, in, uh, in the bill. Um, so that, that's actually it. Uh, so uh, if you want to, um, well, if you want to go and see the project, you're welcome to do. It's a public, uh, and there actually you can see the implementation we have for the blockchain itself. Um, the repository is open. Um, if you have some suggestion for the code, you're open to come and say you can type this better. Uh, I'm, I'm welcome to uh, hearing some suggestions. Um, here you can find us at our website control.com. And you can go to blackseachain.com for viewing our um, um, a, um, a conference we did a few months back where um, I, I made a similar presentation for a blockchain wallet, but uh, my colleagues made presentation explaining how we built the Elixir uh, blockchain itself. So you can go there and check out because uh, we have a video recorded uh, from the conference. Uh, and you can find me at my email. So yeah, thank you. Thank you for taking five minutes, five, ten minutes break. Uh, we'll fill up your cups and bottles, and we'll give you the next one. Yeah. The present from the uh, host. Yeah, oh. you. Thank you. Thanks for the talk. Yeah. Oh. Oh. So how long did it take you for you to, to, to pick it through all of that? Oh, um, 
before I have to go in months. Um, you could say three months. Um, the thing is that most of the stuff, most of the stuff you can do quite quickly. Um, but I, I stumbled upon some of, of the implementation of the extended keys, for example, uh, because in, in, when you read the documentation, uh, you, you read it and then, okay, it's quite, quite simple. You do it and, and then it doesn't happen. And then, okay, what, what is not working? And then you see that, oh, they meant that, they didn't mean that. Uh, so there's uh, like, I think they, they, they made some traps in, <laughs> inside the documentation, so you can stumble upon some issues. Did you use some reference implementation for it as well? Um, well, not actually, uh, because um, there are a lot of implementation of like same keys in a lot of languages, but when you go into it, they use so many libraries that you, uh, you're like, okay, uh, how do you actually do this? And, and then um, when you go into it, uh, well, th there was actually um, a quite nice implementation in Ruby, which is sim uh, similar to Elixir in uh, uh, code-wise. So you can go and maybe um, read it, but then, okay, what? why are they doing this? Why are they doing that? Um, so a lot of the process was actually research. Um, when you start to write the code, it's not actually a lot of code to write. As you see, I, I covered like 90% of the code. Uh, we have an implementation. I just haven't stated how we actually encrypt the, uh, the, the wallet, but uh, we're just using, again, a crypto, li uh, crypto model from, from the airline. So it's quite simple to make. Uh, uh, so, yeah, and one of the next things was this, um, the, the derivation of the public key, uh, this uh, elliptic curve point edition was just such a pain in the ass because at first I was like, okay, we can create our implementation of the elliptic curve point edition and then I I, I look at, at the math and I'm like, uh, <laughs> so, uh, and then, then uh, the, the funny thing is that I think only in C and in Java there is implementation for the elliptical function. One of in, in Java is in Bouncy Castle, which is a, lot, a really old library for all kind of crypto functions, and um, all of the other languages just uh, in some way call the C function of it, and that's how they do it. Nobody wants to create it. Okay. Thank you. I guess you need to take a drink, otherwise you're more than somebody trying by right now. Yeah, you need your head. <laughs> I did get the 
So, hello everyone. Um, my name is Hugo, and um, I work uh, at the moment for a company called MindMatch. So, um, who from the ones here is working in HR? Please raise your hands. Um, who is working in HR? Huh? Yeah. Okay. Human resources. Yes. <laughs> so basically, uh, what MindMatch does, MindMatch is um, we train uh, machines to help uh, human resource people in their daily tasks. So if you are working in HR and you are all overwhelmed with uh, work, we most likely can help you. Um, so that's what we do, do and we basically provide um, trained AI solutions as service. Um, so in my daily work, I had to deal a lot with APIs. And that's basically what I am uh, want to talk about today. So the, the title is Consuming Absent, um, Flexible by IP APIs with GraphQL. So um, who is building APIs besides of me here? Okay. So, um, who has used like or is using GraphQL at the moment? Okay, so um, this is going to be like really an introductionary talk. So um, for the ones who haven't uh, done it, maybe it will give you an inspiration to try it out. It's not that hard and has its its benefits. So actually, uh, the word absent I was already familiar f um, for a while but in a slightly different context. <laughs> um, so if you, if you do some research, you can find out that absence is an elixir of intellect and vision. And that's true. Um, in your experience? Yeah, in my experience as well. Um, yeah, and basically this is um, like, <laughs> absence has been around for a very long time. And this is like a, a, um, a picture from the, 18th century this and supposed to uh, be a regular absent user. <laughs> so building APIs. Uh, so far, um, I've been working with uh, SOAP APIs and tons of REST APIs. Um, they have their benefits and they have their um, boundaries, let's say. And um, yeah, today, like, like I will just briefly go through, like, through them, and um, um, explain what do I think are the strengths and weaknesses of them. So let's start with REST, as that's um, stuff that is most common, at least in my work, has been so far. Um, so the strengths of the um, REST APIs, from my point of view, are like simplicity. Simplicity, because uh, basically, like, um, you can like just by the, the URL you can read what it does or, or what it means um, if if you know it. So um, it is um, lightweight. That means that um, if the API delivers exactly the purpose or exactly the, the, the data that you require, it, it is 
it, it has close to zero of overhead. Um, and um, it is format independent. So um, a REST API usually doesn't care what, what it is returning. Is it uh, XML, is it JSON, is it HTML or whatever. Um, that's from the strengths. Um, now let's talk about weaknesses. So one of them would be um, discovery. From, um, with discovery, I mean that in order to in order to know what actually this API um, does or how to interact with it, what what kind of entities it can as you have to know, either you have to have some documentation or like some other information about it to be able to work with it. So you know that there are questions or there are users um, and you are able to create them. So from, from a, uh, yeah. So from a user's perspective, you have to know this information and REST doesn't deliver you a way to get to know it by default. Of course, like there are um, like, if, like people are, are working with REST for a long while and people have already um, in, in different projects tried to approach this problem as well. Like one of them could be JSON API or, or Swagger that uh, basically um, come up with um, some conventions where, where this discovery is kind of uh, made easier. Like, so if, if there is a way to find out what this API does if you know that's a Swagger API. Um, yeah, and so on. So overfetching. So if you, if you have used um, the API of GitHub, I, I guess most probably most of you have tried it out. So you you let's say you want to get some simple information about a user, like in this case. Um, but what it gives you back is like a massive blob of JSONs containing different kinds of URLs. Um, API, HTML, URLs, different kind of stuff that you most likely don't really need. Which is which is fine if if uh, if you do it, I don't know, once for fun. But if you have to to query this API like um, a lot, then it gives you loads of like overhead in terms of uh, just network traffic and uh, also speed of processing or like parsing the and stuff. Um, that is basically overfetching that you 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 get um, more data than you actually need. And also here there are ways um, there, there are ways like people are trying to solve this with different different um, different approaches. I I don't really uh, know of any standardized approaches so far, but I have seen many people just like uh, use parameters uh, to define fields which they want to have returned um, and this way kind of uh, uh, cutting down on the size of the returned object. Um, and there is underfetching and that basically means let's say for in, in the GitHub, Per, uh, in the, for the GitHub API, let's say I want to um, get um, all the names, the full names of all followers that I had. So here, like in, in, in the GitHub API returns a URL to the followers. But if I query this URL, um, it returns me loads of data about the followers. But one thing that it doesn't in include is the name. So to actually fetch it, I would then need to, for every follower I have, I would need to request this follower's um, like profile and then also with a big massive blob for every follower and, and extract the name out of it. That's basically underfetching. It means that um, something that you potentially could uh, get with one query, you have to do many, many queries to actually achieve. <laughs> so versioning, um, yeah, this is a topic that was already um, well explained in the last meetup, so um, I won't um, 
dig too much into this, but basically versioning has been always kind of a thing that where you have to put your thought in if you have um, you active users for your API and you don't want to break uh, your API constantly for them. Um, this is something where you actually really have to put time in. And there isn't a way um, for, so th there isn't, a REST doesn't deliver you like a way um, to do version. So the solution to all problems, there must be one. And of course, yeah, there is one. So VSDL based SOAP APIs, right? right? Um, this thing must solve like all the problems we have. Okay, let's, let's look deeper in, in kind of what it does. So SOAP VSDL. Um, Okay, so our first issue with REST was discovery that we cannot really know what API does like until really researching or getting the documentation about it. And you know what? So VSDL actually solves this problem because um, you have a VSDL document that describes every like function or every action you can perform on the API. Awesome. <laughs> That's, that's, that works. So overfetching. The thing is that what um, the VSDL document describes is just like a remote um, procedure or function calls, and they still have, um, like, let's say, static parameters that they take and static responses. So you, you cannot really control what they return and what they require for you, um, like from you. So Sadly, okay, doesn't really solve this problem. The same as with, with underfetching. Yeah, so you cannot control what, what the functions or uh, remote procedures return. You cannot really, um, yeah, that's, that's still an issue. And versioning, yeah, as well. Not, not so, was hopeful, but didn't really, didn't really work. So what else do we have? So another approach like, or could be GraphQL, which is like um, the new kid in the block. So, and um, so some of, some of you have, have already worked with GraphQL, but for those who have not, I'll, I'll do like kind of a brief introduction in my style. So it, this is not from any um, documentation or something. It's just how, what I think about GraphQL. Uh, basically, in my words, an introduction to it. So GraphQL uh, delivers you one endpoint. So basically, you have one endpoint where you where you submit your queries um, and you get response. So um, then, so basically, GraphQL accepts. Um, so it requires a query string and an optional optional um, variable subject. So um, I actually I'm actually used to to do most of the stuff from the console. Um, so first, like when I uh, stumbled upon GraphQL, like I for, I couldn't find like any um, examples that show you how to use it from the command line. Most of it was through an IDE. So like it took me some while to to uh, understand how to use it, but this is basically an example uh, query to to the GitHub GraphQL API um, that is so here. So this is um, like the one one endpoint that um, the GraphQL API is using. So we uh, authenticate with the header and we put a payload. So the payload consists of, um, in this case, a query, which is just uh, a GraphQL string, like a, a GraphQL uh, string of a GraphQL code. So, in, and this one is, is fetching the user with the login um, doxus and returning the name of the person. And here we can see the result. So response, we get a JSON object um, that is, 
that has a data key, a user name, Google. Um, so it also has an optional um, variables object. Um, and basically, you use this. Um, so here in this example, you can, you can see I already had to escape the quoting. So um, if you want to like create objects, um, let's say um, you need to create a user and the user can have a description and this description could be arbitrary text. So um, if you would just use the query, you would need to escape yourself manually all the potential characters that are in there. Um, I tried it, I wouldn't suggest you to do that. So someone will figure out something um, weird to put in there um, that it blows up. So please use variables for that. Um, so here is the same query with using variables. Um, here, like I had to write a little bit more in the query section. I had to actually state that that's a query. I had to uh, say that I have a login variable, which is a string and it is not optional. It's required, so we need it. Um, and here, like I do the same, uh, this here uh, continues the same actual query, user login. Here it's just like reference to the variable and the name. And we, we in, in, the, in, the, in the payload of, of the request, and the second key is variables, which just has a JSON object with um, the variable name and the value of it. So, and it basically returns the same thing. Um, yeah. So, main building blocks of a, of a um, graph, uh, of GraphQL are basically types and fields. Um, and types contain fields, and fields return types. So, um, who is you is, is working with typed languages? Okay. So um, for those people, I, I, this will probably feel very nice. Um, for me, I, I have so far on, like worked mainly with Ruby and now with uh, with Elixir. So, but I still love this, um, that you can um, define your API just by defining types. And it, it actually validates um, whether the types are correct um, in execute. So here is just, um, an example um, type for an application, like a sample set of types for an application. So um, taken from the official um, GraphQL homepage. So here, like you always have a root um, query type, which have which has uh, like fields, and the field has. Um, a type of, of uh, or returns a character. And then here we have the character definition that has a name, friends, um, home world spaces, and then like which all return types and all the type, type definitions there. Um, and on, um, on the left side, you see how you can use that to query. Basically, you can say that you want a hero with the name and his friends, and well, you can nest the things inside each other and retrieve the data. Um, yeah, so queries um, for GraphQL is basically like uh, gets for, for um, a REST API. So it is there for retrieving data. Um, the other um, root type like would be a mutation for um, mutation is the equivalent of like a put, post, delete um, for REST API. And um, yeah, you use, you use that to, to create objects, update them or delete them or remove them, yeah. So um, yeah, this is an example of uh, how you perform a mutation inside already this like an um, graphic queue. Graph and, uh, yeah. And so as I said before, 
that mainly most of the implementation already um, implementations already ship um, with um, this graph IQL um, library that is kind of an IDE for for um, GraphQL and what it does um, when you load it, it it first fetches um, all the types that 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 uh, the application has so you can so it actually like suggests you um, so it auto completes when you type and also gives you um, nice documentation about the API already. So, and it, it can do it because everything is based on types and you can start by querying the, the start by querying um, the schema and then check what kind of types it has and then build your an, an internal kind of tree or like a model of the API. Um, so, okay. So far that was about um, an introduction in, into GraphQL. Now let's like try and quickly build a GraphQL server ourselves by using Absent. Um, so here I'll, I'll just um, like, I'll, 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 that won't be any live coding. I'll just show you uh, some uh, slides, how to generate, like how to create an application and uh, get, get it out and running um, with a minimal minimum effort. So um, building a GraphQL server with Absent. Um, first of all, you need um, to have an application uh, to like an Alexa application that you want to add the API to GraphQL API. In this case, we don't have one. We just quickly bootstrap one um, from scratch. So in this case, I'll create a new application called Meetup. Um, plain API application and this application will have um, kind of events, events with the title URL, um, then talks with the title <laughs> description, speaker name, event, um, like it, it, the reference to the, to the event, and um, feedbacks um, with the rating, comment, and a reference to the talk. So uh, that's pretty much it. We we have to set up this thing and it works. The next thing what we need to do is basically adding absent to your project. Um, so in this case it's a Phoenix application. So we need absent, absent plug and absent Phoenix. We add that um, to our mix file and get dependencies and we are ready to go. So for uh, GraphQL, the, the container or the main thing is the schema. And so as we want to be able to make queries, we need to create um, um, a query type. So this is defining the query type uh, where we afterwards can put the actions that we want to perform inside as fields. So we create um, the first um, types. So this will be the event type. And we basically map out like just the fields that we have and their um, types. So at the moment, um, GraphQL is GraphQL by itself is really like has a small set of, of um, like scalar types or the base that it ships with. So there are like, I think five, six types uh, that ship with GraphQL by default, but you can build on top of them um, your own types uh, as you as you want. So, so <laughs> if, you, if you don't extend that, the, the scalar types, you only have ID, string, integer, uh, you don't even have date or, or float or nothing like that. Um, so here we just use the, 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 the types that, um, the scalar types that uh, um, GraphQL has by default. And for URL is a string, title is a string. Then we create a talk, talk a type, which has ID, title, a string, speaker name, string, description string, and 
they are a reference to the event. Just so feedback, basically nothing new, the same, just defining the fields. Um, then the next thing is um, we need actually to define our first um, root query object field. Um, and this, like, for example, we, we want to fetch all the, the possible talks that, that um, are there. And we do it by adding a field to the root query object, the, the name of the field. And we say that, like, um, it's not supposed to be empty and it's a, a list of non-empty talks. And um, we need to, um, a resolver is basically the way how, like, um, graph, like the actual implementation, how to retrieve this um, data for, for those all talks. Um, let's move on to um, the, building the actual resolver. So here, like, we just like alias the talk in the repo. And um, so as, as, the, as the arguments, we, like we have three arguments. The root is, is the, the, the previous, um, previous object. Um, so in, in this case, it will be the query object, the root query object. Um, and then we have arcs, which basically call, uh, contain um, all the arguments that were passed in. But at this, uh, this time, we don't have any, or we don't need any. Um, so we just ignore all of that. And just return a list, or like a list of all um, talks that are in, in the repo. Um, yeah, so next thing that we need to do is we actually need to add roads or um, roads for it. Um, so this is the place where like um, we say that under slash API, we will have the plain, um, the plain GraphQL schema mounted. So this is going to be the API that, that we can, like the endpoint we can query from the, the terminal. And uh, we also, like as everyone does, we include the graph IQL um, under a different uh, route, which um, will, if you visit it with um, with the browser, it will load you like this IDE for um, communicating with um, with the API. So um, there is like um, Absin has also. Um, a way to, to specify the type of um, of this um, graphic queue or the interface. So in this case, it's simple. That's the the, the basic stuff. But you can also um, change it. And like I think there are at the moment two possibilities. One is like the really basic, that, uh, where you can just do the queries and variables and uh, see the documentation. And there is a workspace version of it that allows you also to set headers, um, save um, save queries and do some more advanced stuff, which you need if you have like a more advanced API. But in this case, we don't, we just have a simple thing. So we use the simple one. So, and basically we are done. So we already have uh, our like first, um, um, so our endpoint is running. We can start it up and do our first query. So and we can query for or uh, we can say query or talks. And let's say that we only want the title um, of the talk and it will return as a data object or talks with the titles of each of the talks for today's event. Um, well, it's super simple, right? Yeah. So let's move on. The, the, let's move on. So we have, um, a way to retrieve data. We know how to do that now. Next thing is, um, yeah, so the same thing using the GraphQL that we verified it works. This is how it would, this is how the same thing looks in the GraphQL um, 
IDE events. So um, we move on with creating new mutations. So we, we usually with APIs, we don't only want to uh, retrieve data, we also want to modify the data, create new entries and like interact with them. So for that, we need mutations. So here um, we will we'll just go through quickly how to create um, one, um, how to create like um, a feedback. So our, our API had events, um, talks and feedbacks. So here you can like we basically do the same schema file. We add um, a mutation root um, type, which um, has a field of create feedback and this create feedback returns. So this is the re return um, and it returns a, a feedback uh, object or type back, um, feedback object with a type feed, um, feedback. So, um, and as arguments, we accept um, a rating, which is mandatory, so um, cannot be empty. And um, a comments, optional string, and a top talk ID, so that we can reference to which talk does it belong. Um, and we, we define that like this field will be resolved with um, the resolver create feedback. So now the only thing left is pretty much we need to create the resolver. And here, like it's that simple as well. We we open the resolvers file and just add a create a feedback function um, where we take only the arguments. We already know that like the type system checked that those are the right arguments that we need. Um, and insert those into the database. So this is um, yeah, an, an example. Basically, like we are we are done with with creating with also uh, like creating a, a simple mutation. Um, and yeah, this is uh, the way how we can execute it. Um, we in the query we, we just say mutation. This is just an optional name for it. We can leave it out if we want it as well. Um, define the variables for, for, the, for the input, map them to the actual uh, call of the field and say that in the return, we only want, we only want uh, the ID that's, um, yeah, that's it. That's it. Um, and we, we define the variables below and we are able to create a feedback. So, um, summary. Um, when it comes to building APIs, um, I think, in my, in my opinion, um, GraphQL is very good for app, uh, APIs that um, will be used by multiple clients or many clients. Um, it is good for complex APIs. Um, and it, it is, it is uh, good also for APIs where you basically don't really know what, like, or like it's an early stage thing that you don't really know exactly how it's going to evolve. Um, and in, in my case, those are most of the APIs I built uh, because I mainly work in startups and even the people who own the company usually don't know what they're doing. <laughs> so, um, yeah, with um, Drest, I still think it's a good tool if um, you own the client and you own the API and that's the only client that's ever going to consume it, I think still Rest um, might be the better choice for it. Um, and SOAP, it's super awesome if you have to travel back to the 90s. <laughs> Um, yeah, um, so, uh, well, like in, in the last uh, couple of months, I've been working with, uh, GraphQL APIs implemented in, uh, Node, uh, and Ruby and, and now in, 
Elixir as well. Um, and basically what I really love about um, Absent is like the small things that it actually um, does automatically uh, transform um, the fields from from uh, snake case to to, to camel uh, camel case. So and most like the implementations that I was working before did not do that, and I have spent a couple of hours just debugging this this kind of typos where just like yeah. Um, it's it's wrongly typed and then you cannot figure out what's going on. Um, that's one thing, and it it like um, the people building um, Absent had really put effort into making um, making it easy to to maintain and uh, extract uh, things in different pieces, whether like with um, so. The, um, at least from from the JavaScript implementation, they they haven't put that much emphasis on on that. Um, yeah, that's basically it. If you have any questions, then this is um, the time to ask them. Um, yeah. How is the versioning problems? The versioning problems. Yeah. Because I'm just thinking. It's a one endpoint, right? But, but if I want to have a one breaking change, but I don't want to. Yeah, so basically, um, the versioning, um, GraphQL says that, uh, like, the, the implement, implement uh, the people who implemented GraphQL, they, or they come up with it, they said that, like, it, you don't need any versioning. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, what, what you do is you only have to be super. Um, descriptive when choosing the names of the fields right and types you have to be really descriptive so um the idea would be like if we have now a field that says uh, create feedback and you want to have a breaking change then what they suggest is to create just um, a new uh, field that would say create new feedback or whatever <laughs> and then use that one instead and still leave this one as it is. So from my point of view, that's not really a solution. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so like, um, if you ask me, then no, GraphQL doesn't really solve the versioning problem. This is still something you have to solve yourself. Um, yeah. How do you signal that something went wrong? Like some of the data is missing or whatever, so, um, or like some kind of status code? So you don't return status code um so here i did a super minimal uh try to do super be super minimal usually uh what you do is um to get like here we return the data you also return an errors uh, object with it so if there will be an issue you should fill up the errors object and then return the stuff there so that's kind of the suggested way to do it but the status code is always one yeah 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 that's not that's a uh, metadata like pagination. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there are like GraphQL itself does not tackle this. Like so, there are um, um, I think for that name. But so there there are li uh, libraries on top of GraphQL that uh, um, do that. But it really changes the whole um, um, way how your API looks. So it is possible to do it really pretty easy so you just have to set your mindset i, I forgot the the name of uh, relay. yeah the relay but relay is is for the front end no okay yeah so relay is is tackling basically this kind of issues and it does it pretty good except like the the date that api gets harder to work with or you need some understanding to to work with it So the thing is that you have only one endpoint. Um, so basically, like this application thingy. Yep. So this is actually that application that that I like just 
just D mode, like uh, so yes, so this is what what it, what it, what it does by default. Um, uh, whenever you you fire up like this GraphQL thingy, it makes a query to to the to the API with fetching all the type and field information. And uh, it builds like um, a uh, representation of your API already there. Like so, here in the documentation, you, you can you can say so. You can see we have um, a a two root objects, like a query and a mutation, um, with the root query type, root mutation type, and you can go deeper in the the um, the root query has like all talks. And talk with that, which requires an ID, but you can fetch the single thing. Um, this I did not show in the slide, but I added afterwards. Uh, and then we have the mutation, and you can you can basically go deeper in to see what it is, what kind of arguments it needs, and then like you can just click through everything. And you you don't actually, yeah. This is just like a helper thing. You you can you can do it. Um, just here as well. Um, I need to start something like this. And so, schema, um, and then like the schema has um, types, and yeah, you can basically <coughs> have a look. Um, yeah, so you you can just query like query the ask the API what what it that what what it has what it can do, um, and and here it like it it returns you um, the types it has, um, and afterwards like okay so here we have um, the feedback type we we can just ask it um, type um, name. Feedback. The fields. Yeah. So basically, you can you can just ask the API itself what it can do. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, how do you do authentication? I mean, in the case you want to expose the mutation only in uh, when when somebody is logged in, for example. Okay. So, um, yes. Um, uh, basically, you like you put it as a so far like you put it as like the the authent like um, you pass in a header uh, with the authentication secret. And then you can um, you can have a middleware that um, uh, like validates this secret and fetches the current user, and then this current user can be passed uh, through down to every field, however deep you nest it. You can you can retrieve it and check. Uh, you you can create like checks for every field, or you can create some middlewares that uh, will automatically check for uh, based on some patterns to match. If you have nested stuff, you want to load and suddenly the one of them is not allowed to show the user. Is everything throws back the error or just give all the information except that? What's the standard for that? So um, the standard. Um, or the specification doesn't have anything that says something? The specification doesn't really have anything about that. Um, so the specification is, is super simple. They're like, um, the specification even doesn't say that like uh, the communication layer is JSON. So like there are conventions, there are, is no specification. Um, yeah. But can you do partial data and give error at the same time? Yes, you can. Data, so basically it, it, you can, and it's the, how you want to handle it depends on you. Um, yeah, so you, you can return uh, just partial data, and you can also uh, add uh, uh, next to the data at uh, the error object with the message saying that okay, we could not, you don't have access to this uh, level of 
yield. Okay. Um, thank you for patience. Um, so, five minute break, and then.
Hi, um, I'm Lorenzo Sininci. Um, I'm coding since like a few months in this year, as most of us probably. Um, first of all, I want to say yeah, thank you for uh, staying. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's really hard and it's late and we all had like, work today. Um, I want to say hi to everybody which is watching from home, especially my mom <laughs> and uh, Marco. Uh, <laughs> And uh, yeah, and another thing is like you can find me um, mainly on Google, Facebook, Tinder, Bumble, OkCupid, <laughs> Happen. I don't use Happen that much anymore. Um, yeah, and um, well, why testing cluster of nodes? Uh, who has been working with clusters of Erlang Edisier nodes before? Okay, cool. Yeah. Of course, you know um, well, what I'm talking about. Like, whenever you have uh, an application or LZ application, you actually basically just start a node and then you connect those in different ways. Um, and then you can have distributed, basically, Erlang code running even in different machines in different parts of the world. And they hack like they are exactly the same um, application, uh, same virtual machine. Um, so I wanted to do something like that when I was working and I wanted to write a test for some piece of code that would have to run only and only when it's all, uh, running into a cluster. So when two or more nodes are connected to each other, because bad things could happen when they start doing things separately and then you connect them together. Um, so yeah, this is what I wanted to have. Uh, why? Because um, uh, in my case, I was working with this uh, library for LDZ, which is called uh, Quantum. And Quantum starts a process every time you start an application. And it's sort of like a cron job, like, so you start processing things. Uh, you define a job as a list, whatever. And then you start doing things. And it starts itself as a register process with a name. So this has to be global. And global means in the cluster. So if you have multiple nodes, there will be only one um, registered process with that name that will survive, even if you connect them and they are silently running in parallel for some time before they are connected. So what Erlang will do is you start up two nodes. Both of them will automatically start an application because they don't know what's going on. They, they have no logic for that. And then whenever you connect them, it will kill them and start just one. Um, and then you are safe. But the problem is that while you connect them, something bad could happen. So both nodes can start processing stuff. Imagine a cron job. So they will start doing the same thing on the same database, for instance. And this could blow up in your face. And it's not really fun or nice. So I had to find a way and a strategy to just like run the code with this stupid if. Like if the number of nodes is more than two, let's say, then do that. Um, so how? I tried uh, to research around. Didn't find much about uh, on how to do that in Elysir, but I found it on um, Erlang, um, some game analytics code base, open source there. They, they were doing this. And also in the Phoenix um, code base and GitHub, they have an example of some test which is running specifically in a cluster, and they are doing basically the same thing. I found it later when it was too late. Um, I duplicated this slide, as you can see, because it was nice. And what I'm doing here is um, basically I'm just making sure that distribution is enabled. That's like how you do it uh, in uh, Erlang. And this is um, a tool that comes with the uh, Erlang virtual machine. And you can just making sure it's running. But usually it's just started when you start uh, a node or whatever. Then what you have to do is you have to declare yourself. Ah, by the way, what, whatever I'm saying is running all this into um, IX 
uh, console. So it's easy to do this test when you actually have nodes running and you connect them, how you would do in theory, but it's a little bit more uh, less intuitive when you have to do actually in a, like IX shell. So because you, you need to start a node from the node basically. So in the shell, you will have to do something like that to declare yourself as master node or just enable distribution. Um, after that, there is a nice thing called slave in Erlang and slave lets you start a new node from a node. And in that way, since you define earlier, uh, the, the host and short names, so not resolving the DNS and making sure like you're local, um, you can actually declare, declare a new, um, slave, just giving the host that you gave to the master and an optional name. And in that way, you could run uh, something like that. So the node is like yourself, then node list will return all the nodes that are connected except you. And you can merge them together. You have basically a full list of all the nodes. And this is an example of running those commands. And then at the end, you have two nodes in the same shell. Um, and there, there you can run things. And if you disconnect to the slave, it will basically just die. I'm not sure about it. I haven't checked the dice for real. But, and you shouldn't do it in production or anything. You just like test. Um, so yeah, that's what I came up with, um, in the test helper. So you can write something like this, which is ugly, but it works. And you just give like a number of slave into start slave function, and then it will do a whole bunch of things and basically start a, a number of nodes and you will have them there till you uh, disconnect with them. And, and you do it with the function that looks like that. So in the test, then you can actually run assertion of this kind so you can say multinode.hello we should set simply check the number of nodes should return nil while when i start three more nodes it should return something like this so now when i run um uh, some library that has a register global name and i can just put an if somewhere and i can say if you are in a cluster do this otherwise just wait till you are connected with other nodes um, there is a catch, um, not quite sure about it as well, but it could happen that you have multiple cluster in a cluster because they don't know about each other. And it's a, not a common case, but could happen. So you have to be also aware of it. Um, and that's it. If you have any question, you can ask. Sorry, so the latest one I have a question. Why are you using the multiple nodes, multiple cluster to make it faster or just some tests in two clusters or? Uh, we, are, we are using multiple nodes already for historical reasons. Mm -hmm. um, not particularly taking advantage of it right now. And yeah. But is there some reason, some checking to make sure the test also passes in the cluster or? To make sure that you run the code in the cluster only once. Because basically when you have a cluster of nodes in production, what you do I mean, you have different ways of doing it, but our way is like we start up the nodes and then we find their host name and then we connect or the names and then we connect them. But before they are connected or when they start till the moment they are connected, they will start doing things because they think, oh, I'm alive. I can do stuff like they start processing the job. And this is something you don't want to do. So you have to find a way around and building a strategy or something for your libraries where you just inject this and say, run only run this kind of stuff only when you are sure you are already with the yeah connected in the cluster not alone so you don't run the same query in the database twice so you don't process the same thing at the same time race condition all kind of stuff um and in the test case you just ran one ix and the one ix you have three clusters no you have a uh, one cluster four nodes at the end because you start three nodes actually no wait a second now here only, yeah, cluster with two. Because one, it's me, the master. When I do start, I basically enable distribution. But the same shell, right? Yeah, that's the same shell. So from this shell, here I just make sure that the distribution is enabled, but it is already. Here I do start, node start, which starts myself as a distributed node. And after that, you can see here that the name changes within the shell. And then from here, now I can do a slave start link, which will start a new node within uh, my node. Sort of inception of 
things. And then the, the most important thing is that you have to match this host with this one. Um, and then also this one is very important, short names, because you will not resolve the DNS. Yeah, the name, you can give whatever name you want, and then you return just a tuple like this, okay, and the name of the node. So at this point, you can connect yourself to this one. Well, you're already connected here, but you could start another shell somewhere else, connect to this one, or do crazy things. I haven't tried, but you could probably. Yeah. Where are you hosting? Sorry? Where do you host your app? Um, not allowed to say that. <laughs> Sorry. I, I asked David if there is Why? a. Um, I saw recently there was a service called Gig and Lixin, which is like Heroku, but it, it's, it's designed around the beam. So if you want a clustered service, then all of that you get. The system disks and all the things that the beam expects to have mm. available. So it's, I haven't used it yet myself, but it sounds really good. Does anybody here have experience running clusters? No? Yeah, but damage. And then you can use this? Yeah, no, actually. No, the thing is, you, you go for airline and then you see you can have multiple nodes, but your content then is multiple nodes. <laughs> so once you do this, run the cluster in the same run the cluster in the same node to make sure everything works properly. That's what you now the same thing you do. Yeah, yeah, basically. And you now that you overestimate your complexity, then you just run. Well, no, but <laughs> you, but even having uh, different nodes in the same machine can let you do quite nice stuff like. If you run like this kind of processes that are registered, for example, you can uh, create a node which is uh, hidden and then communicate like, well, basically, um, yeah, let them not see each other so they can do things maybe at the same time without colliding with each other. I don't know. There, there are different ways you can use the cluster, not necessarily for scaling it, but even just like simply designing the, the application the way it works. For now, we don't have really a special reason for using it. Do you have an idea? Mm -hmm. uh, no. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think it's because we are running Docker. So I think yeah. we have uh, two machines and we bring down one at a time. So essentially, it's to still add something up while you are uh, doing one. But yeah, if you can avoid. Yeah, <laughs> because we, you shouldn't have downtime, but yeah. sometimes you have it even more. Yeah. You can also use it for um, scenarios where you need some complex session management, for example, if you have um, mm. multiple API nodes and you only, if you ensure that you only have one online process running across the whole cluster. For one user, for example, um, then it's kind of handy to run you know, multiple learning nodes and then you know, somehow coordinate mm. this process. Uh, another use case could be when you're doing batch processing and you want to spread, you want to scale out in multiple nodes. And uh, so if you're running in a cluster, then it's, it becomes pretty easy to. Yeah, yeah, this was also that was also the case how we started here because we had this batch processing with a like of a lot of a lot of data and background and has to run every hour and has to do a lot of things, API calls, yeah, a bunch of things. So you can actually span it across different nodes and it will be less heavy instead of just one. I remember there was a talk by Nathan Harold, uh, Intercom uh, in Barcelona last year, and uh, uh, he was talking about like the, the trials and tribulations, the making sure that you know there's only one instance of, of something running across that. Um, uh, he's actually local here in uh, Berlin, but uh, mm. the, the talk was in Barcelona, I guess. Uh, I don't remember, I'm too tired to remember all the exact things, <laughs> but they have. Uh, 
Okay. Cool. Yeah, that's it. Any more question? Then thank you. Yeah, I like it.